All right, everyone. Thank you for uh, for joining us uh, today for our last uh, sports economics webinar uh, of the of this academic year. Um, we had excellent talks uh, earlier this year as well. Uh, we are concluding uh, with this talk uh, on finding your X factor, carving out a niche for medical success. Uh, just before we start, and, uh, and before I introduce our uh, excellent speaker today, just some ground rules. Uh, so please mute yourself. And uh, if you can turn off your video, because we want to maximize the uh, bandwidth for, uh, for everybody on this, uh, on this call. Um, just a reminder, this will be uh, recorded and it will be available for playback on the AMSSM YouTube channel uh, in about 24 hours or so. So if you miss this or have any other uh, burning questions uh, or just uh, or missed a certain part that you want to watch again, uh, please uh, view it on the AMSSM YouTube channel. Now, questions uh, that you have for our speaker, uh, I would ask that you uh, type it into the chat. Uh, we will have some time at the very end of this talk uh, reserved for Q&A. Um, and so we will go through as many of those questions as we can. Um, and if we get through before time, then good. Uh, if uh, we run out of time, um, Dr. Ira Frady uh, can uh, leave some, uh, some feedback um, if she so chooses um, that you can uh, contact her if, uh, with any questions. So last thing to say uh, before I introduce our speaker today um, is that we do have our next uh, webinar series uh, coming up. The next one is actually not a webinar. It's actually going to be within the uh, July 2023 AMSSM Fellows Research and Leadership Conference. It's the jobs panel, um, and it's geared towards the fellows. Uh, in August or September 2023, we will resume our webinars, um, and the first topic that we will uh, be discussing is subspecialization in sports medicine, uh, and that talk will be given by Dusty Narducci and John Dresner, uh, moderated by Kathy Wen. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Julia Iafredi. Uh, is a physician who specializes in sports and dance medicine at NYU Langone uh, Health in New York City. A Canadian citizen, she completed her undergrad uh, training at McMaster University, graduating with an honors bachelor's of science degree in kinesiology. She later moved to the United States of America to pursue a career in medicine. She received her medical degree from Midwestern University Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine, she subsequently com completed her residency in PM&R at the Mayo Clinic, followed by a sports medicine fellowship at the University of Iowa. Her primary clinical interests include all types of musculoskeletal injuries, college and professional level sports coverage, dance medicine, diagnostic and interventional ultrasound guided procedures, global health and nutrition, and resident teaching. Dr. Iafredi has appeared on various media outlets discussing healthcare in the United States, is a peer reviewer for multiple performing arts journals and frequently lectures on dance medicine and musculoskeletal ultrasound nationally and internationally. She works with multiple dance schools in New York City, was medical consultant for Jagged Little Pill during its Broadway run, works with Alvin Eiley Dance Theater, is team doctor for Gotham FC, and is one of the rotating team physicians for the US ski team. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling the world, dancing, rock climbing, and alpine skiing. Dr. Ira Frady is an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery and rehabilitation at NYU and sees patients in three locations in Manhattan. Dr. Ira Frady is a New York Magazine Super Doctors rising star in sports medicine in the years 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. We're very lucky to have her uh, here today. And Dr. Ira Frady, please take it away. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys about um, this topic uh, because it's actually become quite near and dear to my heart as I have learned a lot over the last couple of years. And I want to be able to share with you kind of how to figure out what your X factor is and how to carve out a niche for medical success. So um, like uh, Elliot was mentioning, um, I, I work with a lot of different uh, companies and I am a consultant for a number of them. So for once the disclosure slide is something that we're actually gonna talk about a little bit more in depth because these are all the things that I do on top of my regular normal job. Um, I do some consulting work for a number of different companies. I'm a brand ambassador with FIGS. I'm a host of the orthopedic show on Sirius XM. Um, I have been a medical expert on a number of um, news uh, outlets. Uh, and I work with the US ski team, Gotham FC, soccer, and Alvin Ailey dance, to name a few. 
Um, this is just a little bit about myself in terms of like where I did my residency, my fellowship. I, I'm really proud of where I trained because I think it made me into the best doctor that I could possibly become. Um, and, and now I'm an assistant professor of sports medicine at NYU, uh, as was mentioned. So first of all, how did I get here? Um, so I grew up in the town that's on the right hand side of your screen. It's called Font Hill. It is very, um, very green and not, and very spread out. There's not a lot there. Um, it's a town of about 5,000 people. And I think we had three stoplights, um, last I checked. So, um, you know, how did I get from there to New York, right? So um, I've moved a fair amount during my training since relocating to the United States for medical school in 2008 and really never did any single component of my training in the same state. And there was a reason for that. Um, I was trying to get a feel for a country that I was not familiar with and uh, trying to figure out where I kind of fit. And so my personal pursuit of happiness, if you will, took me from Southern Ontario, Canada, which apparently is just, you know, whiteness in this picture, um, and brought me down to Glendale, Arizona, followed by Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, Indiana, Rochester, Minnesota, Iowa City, Iowa. And then, you know, all of these places were amazing places to train, and yet something didn't quite feel right. I didn't feel like I could stay there long term. Um, I figured I might get bored. I needed something um, bigger. And so, you know, the logical next step, of course, when you're looking for bigger is you move to New York City, the Big Apple, right? So um, that was how I ended up um, in New York City. And uh, even though it's kind of this far cry from the sprawling greenery of my hometown, this is honestly the first city in the United States that's actually felt like home to me. Uh, it's, it's kind of my concrete jungle. I love it. And so I needed to figure out how do I make a life for myself here? Because it's so different from, you know, so many other places that I've lived so far. So carving out a niche really means, you know, trying to find a way to set yourself apart. And I love this quote from Coco Chanel, people think all the doors are opened in front of me, but it was me who pushed them open. And I, I really stand by that. I really believe that because um, there's not a lot of handouts I think that you get um, when you don't have any ties to medicine. So I, I don't have any, you know, nobody in my family was in medicine. I'm from a different country, like I said. And so I didn't feel like um, when I first started out that I was going to get a lot of help. And so I really did try to figure out how to, you know, push down you know, any obstacle that got in my way, I was either going to climb over it, crawl under it, you know, deke it out and roll around it, whatever it was, um, just to try to figure out how to set myself apart. Um, and when you want to carve out a niche, you want to try to find or spot a useful area that no one else has really identified yet. And whether that's being able to, you know, explain something extremely well, um, know something nobody else knows, which I feel like is really hard to do, or even create a new way of doing things, that's something that can help set you apart. And so the thing is, one, I, I know a lot of the people on this, um, on this webinar are people that just graduated from residency or fellowship, and, and there's something that you need to understand. There needs to be a need for what you're doing. So you have to realize that no matter what you do in life, you need to figure out a way to sell it. And um, we are all in sales, all of us. Medicine is sales now. You and your skill set are something that can be marketable and needs to be bought or bought into at least. Um, and so it needs to have some sort of worth to people. And unless you just want to volunteer, then if you only want to volunteer and not make money off of what you're doing, then make whatever you want to be your niche because it doesn't matter. You can make, you know, I bake, I don't know, uh, Play-Doh pies. Nobody's going to eat them. Nobody's going to buy them. But if that's what you find fun, go knock your socks off. But your niche can be what you want it to be. Unless you want to make some sort of money off of it, then it needs to be something that has a need that people want, that people want to buy into. So you have to think of that while you're trying to figure out what sets you apart, okay? Um, in my case, this is part of what sets me apart. I, you know, I'm, I happen to be foreign and um, I am going to get to the point in our story today about why that's important and why that was a big deal for my story. So um, I tried to break this talk down into steps, um, something that's pal palatable, something that's attainable, 
something that can help you um, figure out what goals to set for yourself to help you discover your X factor and therefore create a niche. Um, and so step one is find what you love, okay? I feel like my, my uh, picture here is like kind of overhanging some of the photos, but you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. So um, one similarity that we know that we can draw from any successful position or even an entrepreneur is that all of them have built a business around what they absolutely love. And it's not this kind of half-hearted, let's see where this goes kind of interest. It's really honestly like an affinity for a product or an idea that makes them jump out of their beds every morning with this burning passion and intention. And the reason that is, is when you put all of your weight into something that drives you like at your core, it works like this magnet where like anybody else who also has an interest in it gets attracted to you. Um, and so that's going to attract number one, the right people and number two, the right opportunities. Um, and so you have the advantage of being able to play number one to your strength, but also develop kind of the grit to learn and adapt much more easily if, if you do have a passion for what it is that you're doing. Um, so in my case, some of my greatest loves are dance, skiing, and just being in nature. Um, and so a lot of the connections I've made over the years are due to a mutual love of something. So people recognized my passion, saw my excitement for something, and brought me into these opportunities. And so one such opportunity was, you know, with the U.S. ski team, which, you know, a number of these pictures are of. So my first opportunity with them was actually when I was still in fellowship, so still in training. And one of my attendings and mentors was traveling with the Nordic combined team to Norway. And I said, can I come? And I knew I was going to have to pay my way for it. And that was something I was totally willing to do because I knew it was an opportunity to number one, do something I love. And also I knew it could lead to maybe a longer partnership if I, if I did a good job and I was planning to do a good job. So, so that ended up being a really cool opportunity because right out of fellowship, I was invited to join uh, the U.S. ski team um, uh, group of team physicians. And I was actually the first Canadian to join because prior to me, apparently they had some sort of rule where you had to be a U.S. citizen because apparently I was going to steal all your U.S. ski team secrets and sell them to Canada, maybe. I don't know. But anyways, uh, they got rid of that rule uh, and I was able to join on. Um, one of my first and kind of favorite opportunities as a dance doctor um, happened very early on in my career when I first moved to New York. Um, I actually offered to give in-person lectures to some of the bigger dance studios and dance schools in the city and built this subdivision of dance medicine within our sports medicine division at my previous hospital. Um, and I gave webinars to the teachers at these dance studios so that they would talk to their professional dancer friends about me and say, hey, we met this great dance doctor, she gets it. She's a trained dancer herself. She understands what we go through. You should really think about seeing her. And so automatically I started getting this patient population, not because I necessarily went to them directly, but because I networked in a way and showed my love for this, this part of, uh, of medicine. And so they understood my passion. And so that's kind of what I was talking about when I say like, find your love first and foremost, hands down. The next step, oops, there we go. The next step is figure out what you're actually good at, right? So once you've discovered the passion, it's important to figure out what you're actually going to excel at um, or what, what kind of excellence you have because your love and your expertise don't actually necessarily overlap. You know, I might love flying, but it doesn't mean I'd make a good pilot. In fact, I'd probably make a really crappy pilot, to be honest. I just want to get to the place that we're going and I'm excited about it. So I'll let someone else fly the plane, but I will happily be in it. Um, so figure out where you excel. So, you know, what are your end of year reviews say about you? Um, maybe you're a really great proceduralist. Maybe um, you're an excellent communicator. Um, maybe you're very, very organized, which I am not. I will never, ever claim to be that person because it is very much not me. But whatever that is, you need to kind of figure out what you're good at. And then you need to research and learn about the problems that your target audience is actually experiencing and which ones you yourself are capable of solving for them. Um, you need to think about how you can set yourself apart from the rest of the, you know, other providers or other doctors in that area of, you know, this niche that you, you're interested in, or which particular aspect of the niche hasn't really been um, looked into yet or addressed. Um, what can, um, when, 
you zoom in on those few things that you can deliver kind of really, really well, then that immediately shows and patients and colleagues will immediately label you as like this go-to source for that particular part of the specialty. Um, and so I always found my strength to be educating people and interventional procedures. That's, that's what I excel at. And so I realized I was able to take kind of complex medical jargon and break it down and make it make sense for people like lay people um, who otherwise maybe wouldn't necessarily have the best understanding of a lot of these terms. So then step three is find what makes you original. Um, personally, much of my originality stems from um, my substantial travels and kind of being a somewhat nonconformist or having nonconformist like behaviors. You know, I put one of my tattoos up just to make a point of the fact that like I'm okay with being a pretty, you know, I'm, I'm fairly tatted and, and I've had patients ask about it and I've had patients think it was, you know, weird and I've had patients love it and think it was something that, you know, helped them relate to me. Um, I tend to figure out different ways of doing things than when, you know, than how it's usually done if I don't really agree with the status quo or I don't really like it. And that behavior has gotten me some really cool opportunities, including like this little modeling thing that I did um, for Susanna Monaco, who's a designer here in New York, who wanted to do a set of posts about women in STEM. So I got to go to Croatia and do a photo shoot, which is kind of cool and not something I necessarily thought I would ever do as a physician, right? Um, I also came to realize that part of what made me different was actually my immigration status and um, my ability to share my story, which initially was not a story I had any intention of sharing until I kind of felt like I had to. My hand got forced a little bit. So that story ended up making national news in May of 2020 because of this picture right here. So um, I had been volunteering in the ICU at my hospital in New York City um, when I got a notification that my green card application had actually been denied. Um, and, um, you know, at that time I was kind of in this mode. So, um, you know, for the six months, uh, I had kind of given up any chance of seeing my family. I um, watched medical colleagues die. I worked in this ICU where, you know, this incessant beeping of ventilators, you couldn't make eye contact with anyone. You couldn't hold the hand of anyone who you were taking care of because you were just gowned in this, in this getup because we had no idea what we were dealing with. And I was truly at the epicenter of it all. Um, but I, you know, I made the decision to move to the front line so that somebody else wouldn't have to. I did it because I knew my chance of survival were better than a lot of my older colleagues. I did it because I was closer to residency and my, you know, my training, I had faith in my training and felt like I knew I could do a good, you know, do a good job. And I felt like I didn't know how not to help. And so that was something I did regardless of where my immigration status stood. And yet during this point in time, um, my green card application got denied. So it was 700 pages long. Um, I had submitted it in June of 2019. So well before the pandemic started. And I had letters of support from professional athletes I'd taken care of, um, coaches, um, other medical colleagues. And per my lawyer, it was a great application, should have gone through no problem. And yet, because of that insert uncertainty that happened during COVID, you know, the USCIS or the United States Immigration Services shut down. And on April 20th, this nationwide immigration ban went into effect. And that affected other people like me um, who had applications in and the, the division closed down so then nobody could do anything with that application. And so eight days after that, so on April 28th, um, I received a notice that my green card application had been denied. And so just like that, after living in this country for 13 years, I was all of a sudden going to be deported, um, which sucked. Uh, <laughs> And the official reason that they gave for the immigration ban was to give Americans like a chance to gain employment before citizens of other countries. Um, but I hadn't really stolen anyone's job, right? I was already working here and it was during the pandemic. So that's why I took to social media. That's why I posted that picture with, the, you know, the sign saying I'm an immigrant and working on the front lines during COVID. And, you know, apparently um, people heard me. So I did a number of appearances on CNN, Fox 5 News, Toronto Radio. Um, I received an outpouring of support, but also quite a bit of backlash. Um, the comment sections in a lot of these interviews, you know, ranged from everything from marriage proposals to um, telling me I should go back to Mexico, which wrong side of the country, but, you know, geography is hard for some Americans, I guess. But, you know, <laughs> so it was really frustrating. 
um, because people were even theorizing that I had moved to the front lines to, um, to get paid more, uh, which was so funny to me because I was actually taking a pay cut and wasn't eligible for hazard pay because of my immigrant status. So I basically worked in the ICU for free for six months. Um, so eventually my lawyer was able to get the initial portion of the um, national interest waiver of my green card application reopened for a supervisor to review. And gratefully, um, a few weeks later, the um, decision was reversed. So I could actually at least go back to work. It didn't mean I had a green card, but it meant I could go back to taking care of patients while they pondered and thought it all through. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, on August 27th, so a couple months later um, in 2020, I was finally approved for that green card and it was um, sent to me on September 5th. And so after 13 years, 80 bajillion visas, uh, pandemic, thousands of dollars and nearly being deported, I finally got to say I was a permanent resident of the United States of America. And was it worth it? Of course, sure. Um, do I think it should have been this hard? Absolutely not. And I'm, I'm not sure it would have been this hard if it had been any other time of the year. Um, and yet it happened during, you know, the, the worst year of our, of our existence thus far. So I just want to reiterate something to you all so you can understand this. Um, Back in 2020, they had this um, executive order to suspend employment-based visas. And I just want you to understand, a lot of your colleagues are immigrants. Just because we don't all talk about it doesn't mean that it's not true. Um, over 25% of physicians in this country are foreign, which means about 200,000 physicians in this country are either you know, physicians or surgeons. Um, there's a lot of us in the healthcare industry. And you know, this kind of became a big part of me because it felt like a voice that I had that I had to share for other people to help them understand, you know, what we as an entity of immigrants were going through. And, it, it, you know, the fact that I'm Canadian versus somebody from Ethiopia versus Zimbabwe, you know, to a lot of people, they're like, well, you speak English and you drive on the same side of the road. It should be easy. And, you know, theoretically, yes. But when it comes to immigration status, those things don't matter. Um, and so this part of me kind of became what made me original um, and maybe what kind of spurred a lot of my, my niche or my interest in my, my, my next niche. Um, it helped me identify what I wanted my niche to incorporate. And that was being a voice for people that didn't always have one. So then step four is, you know, kind of find find the void, right? So after this stressful experience, I was able to kind of refocus my efforts on, you know, honing my expertise in sports medicine. And so that's where this step four came in. You need to kind of look at what the medical community is missing and you need to consider your own long-term goals, right? Your personal goals. What do you want to achieve in your career? Do you want to be a great researcher? Do you want to be a great teacher, uh, a clinician? Or is there a certain sports population that seems like they're not well cared for enough? Um, for example, for me, I found a void within performing arts, right? So specifically with taking care of breakers and hip hop dancers. So a lot of the literature that exists in dance medicine is all on ballet and modern. There's very little on injury prevention for, you know, the more quote unquote urban population. And, and that, that's the type of dance I did. I was a salsa and a hip hop dancer. So um, I was able to kind of break into that world by being an educator for that population, not, you know, not the, not the Misty Copelands of the world, but, you know, all of the, um, you know, uh, Twitch who, who unfortunately passed away um, last year, but like uh, Twitches of the world instead. Um, and then another example is one of my previous fellows had a huge interest in esports, And so she recognized that void became an expert very quickly at it. And now she's the head of esports division in her hospital. And you know, she's only like maybe what, two, three years out of fellowship, which is fabulous. Um, so once you know what you want to achieve, you can start to kind of see what part of the void you can fill. And don't be afraid to experiment, okay? It's okay to try different things, see what works, see what doesn't. You won't always find your niche right away. You need to kind of keep exploring you need to keep learning. You need to figure out what space you want to fill in the void because the void is large, okay? I know it seems small sometimes, but it is big and there's a lot of room for all of us in it, okay? And then step five is do the math. We love math, right? Step five, take your love, take your excellence or your, you know, the thing that you're good at and take your originality and let it break up the void. So find mentorship, find um, doctors who have found a niche that you admire 
and ask them for advice. Build uh, networks. You never really know, you know, what connection might come in handy down the road. Um, and be patient. So this, this is none of this is something that happens overnight. This didn't happen overnight for me. Okay. Um, you need to kind of think about like, how can I fit into this weird ball of madness that we have going on? And in order to create a worthy niche, it, it really does take a lot of time and effort. And please realize that like, you don't have to find mentorship at your home um, institution. So this is my ultrasound family. Okay, which is a big part of my practice as well. And um, if you notice, jo Dr. Joanne Borgstein's on there. She's my godmother. And um, she became one of my mentors the first year out of fellowship. So I had never trained under her. I have never actually worked with her. You know, I didn't meet her for the first time until like probably two years out of fellowship. But as you can see on this little graph of family, she's my only woman relative besides my children now. Um, so she's the only female mentor I've ever had. And she truly was one of the first to insist I got a seat at the table. She vouched for me. She looked out for me. She spoke up for me and she saw what I had to offer and she helped me hone it. She helped me hone the skills that I have now um, and, and really helped me become like the, the type of doctor that I wanted to become. So I am forever grateful to her. And I have tried to do that for you know, my fellows now and anybody who you know, has asked for mentorship um, from me and whether that's male female it doesn't really matter it's just the point that like she saw something in me and helped me build that and I, I think that there are other um, physicians that have the ability to do that for all of you you just have to learn to want to ask for it and then step six is go where you're appreciated so this sounds obvious and like once you've found your niche it is definitely easier to create job satisfaction and impact but I can honestly speak from experience that, you know, even when you found your niche, you might need to work to find the correct home for it. Um, like, for example, my first job out of fellowship felt like exactly the right fit for me. Um, I had mentorship at a sports medicine program. Um, I was building a dance medicine program. And during the pandemic, I kind of realized, even though I had the support of my department, I, I didn't feel as well supported by my hospital system. I didn't feel like I could nurture my passions. Um, I wasn't allowed to do media. I um, wasn't allowed to build an online presence. And so I kind of felt stifled. So I made this change. Um, I learned how to navigate this kind of fine line between orthopedics, sports medicine, and physiatry. Um, I found an academic center that seemed to kind of appreciate my style or my, my type of medicine. And I learned to play nice in the sandbox. Um, so understand that it's okay that you won't be for everyone and that and that's fine um for some they like and support the status quo and that's cool please don't get frustrated please 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 because uh, i did and it's it's really frustrating and it only hurts you um realize just those those people aren't your people um and so if you can go where you're appreciated you're going to feel you know more at home you're going to feel more supported and you're going to want to continue to build that niche because you're going to feel like it's being recognized and, and people are seeing your worth. And so um, one kind of, of my favorite opportunities actually happened in 2021. Um, in February, I received this Instagram message on, um, on my social media uh, from the head of social marketing um, asking about my interest in collaborating on a project um, to work with the Awesome Human campaign from Fakes. So within a month of our first meeting, we shot a commercial about my life uh, over a single weekend. And I was super excited about this, but had a feeling my medical center might not be super stoked about it. Um, and so I didn't use my full name. I just, I said, my name is Dr. J. Um, and something that I think could have been an awesome um, marketing campaign for me ended up being something I was simply an actor in, which, you know, solely because I was afraid to rock the boat. And um, some of you might've seen it. I'm gonna show you just like a quick clip. Hopefully it's not super loud. Yeah. So it, this is literally something that we did in a weekend based on my life. That's my friend right there. This girl is actually one of my patients. Um, some of the football players that show up a little bit later are some of my patients. Like we really took my life and, and put it on screen. And it was such a cool experience because I got to talk about all the things that I was annoyed with and pissed off about and whatever, um, and got to share it with everyone. And so I'm gonna fast forward along. Um, 
to this part. So it, it was just this really fun commercial that I got to do where I got to say, I'm okay with being different. And it, it was appreciated and it, it spoke to a lot of people. But again, I couldn't use my real name. So a lot of people, you know, if you didn't actually know me personally, you wouldn't have been able to search me. You wouldn't have known it was me. But from that, I've been able to do a lot of other great collaborations. And um, I've, um, I've worked with companies that have kind of a similar outlook to what I have on medicine. Um, and I've gotten to do a lot of interviews um, with news outlets and dance magazines and different types of podcasts. And yes, of course, there are things that I've said yes to that later on didn't feel like the right fit. Um, so I respectfully back out and there was no, you know, no hard feelings. And many of times I've said no to something and it wasn't necessarily a hard no, it was just a not right now. And that's okay, you're allowed to do that. Um, I'm doing kind of what feels right for me right now. And, um, what feels honest because otherwise, trust me, if, if you don't do something that you have the interest in and that your heart and soul believes in, you're not gonna wanna do it. You're gonna get too tired. You know, I do all of this stuff on top of my normal job, right? On top of my normal clinic. And if I didn't absolutely love doing it, I honestly, it wouldn't be worth it to me. Um, except this, this is always worth it to me. So um, I've been invited to lecture quite a bit nationally and internationally. And it's something I kind of always say yes to because I, I really love teaching. Um, and so this is one of the most recent ones I've done. This was in Seafield, Austria for the 30, 37th annual German Austrian Swiss Congress on sports medicine and sports traumatology. So I was the only non-surgeon at this thing and also the only non-German speaker. Um, but they flew me out there to give a lecture on um, tendon overuse injuries in sports. Um, and so because the rest of the conference was in German, I decided to just go skiing um, <laughs> while the rest of the, the conference was going on. So there are many perks to, uh, to some of these uh, jobs. So all I'm saying is I have been able to meet some really incredible people who have inspired me and helped me get better at social media um, now that I'm actually allowed to promote myself on it. And um, these days I get asked to lecture at AMSSM, ACSM, um, CASM yearly. Um, I have my radio show. I've become a medical expert on multiple news um, stations. And these are the things that have helped kind of build my niche. And um, along with being a dance doctor and a team physician, I get to educate the masses um, in multiple different avenues. And it kind of makes me feel like I'm truly making a difference. And so I just want to say kind of in closing, trust me, if I can find my X factor, so can you, um, but you can't be afraid to fall short, right? Um, it's, it's kind of like learning a new sport. You have to train for it. You need to make errors. You need to learn how to make adjustments um, and learn from those errors. And you need to be mentally and physically prepared to, to, for both the wins and the losses. You know, you got to take an L sometimes. So like I lost a lot in 2020. Like I, I had a bunch of mishaps and, and I almost got deported for all of those things. And yet it still wasn't a failure and it didn't make me a failure. Just because it was a crappy year doesn't make me a failure. Um, instead, it just gave me kind of more ammunition to keep fighting. So I hope that all of you kind of feel a little bit of a fire under your butts and want to kind of create a niche for yourselves in the medical field, whatever that happens to be. And, and just know that like, it's okay to not do it properly the first time around, you'll, you'll get there, I promise. You just, you know, you have to fight for what you love. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I am happy to stay on and do, you know, all of the question and answer period. Um, that's my email if you have any questions that you don't wanna ask live. And that's my Instagram if you want to send me a message on there or whatever. So should I stop sharing, Elliot? Uh, no, you can keep it out there. Yeah, just okay. keep it out there. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ayurfredi. That, that was a great talk. You know, I think you mentioned a lot of great points that a lot of us um, who used to either used to be in private practice, currently are in private practice, are now realizing too that is that medicine is a business. Um, yeah. I always, yeah, I, I always give this uh, this quote uh, when I talk about medicine as a business is that 
you know, whether you like it or not, it is a business. The train's going to leave with or without you. So it's your choice whether to get on or you're going to get left behind. Um, right. And I love that quote from uh, from Coco Chanel too. Um, yeah. But you know, I, I think you touched on a, a, a different point too, where you know, yeah, and she had to she had to push open a lot of doors herself. But then you know, shaking this tree of contacts um, will open some doors for you too. It'll make your life a whole lot easier too. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think opening that like pushing open the door means being open to meeting new people, right? If you just stay in your little bubble and hope that somebody's going to be like, you, you seem nice. We're going to take you with us everywhere. That's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, this isn't a fairy tale. So you, you need to make the connections. I remember like during residency, one thing I always made sure to do, you know, I, I was looking to find a fellowship that I was going to really love. And so during like ACSM and AMSSM, I went and hung out with program directors. No offense to my co-residents, but I didn't need to hang out with them. They weren't going to get me anywhere. So I went and networked with the program directors and like, not like, oh, I want to be your best friend. You know, can I follow you everywhere? I got to know them on a personal level so that they saw that, you know, I would be, um, I would be a great fit for their program. And they saw that they would actually enjoy working with me because they actually liked me as a human. So like, I think those kinds of networking skills not everyone has them, but it's something that you could certainly hone for yourself. And it makes a world of a difference when you're, you know, out there in practice and trying to figure out where you're going to fit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is a, a comment that was left in the chat. Uh, it's from uh, Dr. Maria Bianchi. It says, uh, you're a great inspiration to us international physicians. Thank you for sharing your story. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, everybody. Uh, in the uh, for those in the audience, if you want to ask questions, please put them in the chat, um, and we'll give some people uh, some time to think about any questions to put in there. Uh, but I actually do have some questions for you. I think you mentioned uh, something that was very uh, important in terms of kind of establishing your own niche, becoming the expert, finding the finding the void. Um, but to start general, you're. Uh, you graduated residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, let's say, you know, for example, if you were going to go out into a community that were just physiatrists, not necessarily specialized in sports medicine, how would you differentiate yourself in that uh, type of setting? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think our CAQSM really can, um, holds a lot of power for us. I think that the additional training that we get um, from it and under it um, can really can really carry us and can really make us kind of like the hyper specialist. So my big thing is being able to reach out to those uh, general physiatrists or you know any general physician who who maybe has some interest in sports medicine and saying, look, you know you want to if they're going to send you know uh, Achilles tendonitis to a physical therapist, that's fine. You don't need me to do that, and that's okay. But I think that being able to show them that I have this extra skill set that, you know, if you need me, I'm here, not to try to push them out of the way, but to say, like, I have a skill set that I have really honed and I want to help you make your patients better. Um, and so educating the physiatrist or educating any of those, you know, um, you know, uh, physicians that have no board certification in sports medicine, and then also educating your patients. So, um, you know, I have no problem being a second opinion for, for a lot of uh, patients. And I do get a lot of patients to come see me that are coming to see me after they've seen someone else because they need a second opinion for that, that next level or high, higher level issue. Um, and I, I really do my best to try to educate them. Like I said, taking the time to break down a complex medical issue and make it make sense to people goes a really long way. I know it makes you slower in clinic. I know you end up having to write your notes after clinic instead of during clinic, because trust me, I have so many notes to do still. And yet it goes a long way. It helps patients understand things. And so I think that, um, that is one way that we can really differentiate ourselves is because we have that greater knowledge of like these musculoskeletal issues and like the, the, the um, functional losses that can potentially come along with them. And then we also understand the athlete's mind, right? Or the athletic individual's mind about how like a lot of these sports define them. I mean, my dancers like dance defines them. If they can't do it, they lose their minds. Same thing with, you know, people that run, you know, I'm not a runner, I don't like running. And yet people that run, they, they go nuts if they can't run for a week, you know what I mean? So being able to educate them in a way that makes it seem like, hey, it's me and you in this together, I think that is a way that we can differentiate ourselves um, from like kind of the more generalists that try to take care of sports injuries. Yeah, that, that's definitely important. I think, uh, you know, 
differentiating yourself from those who have done it for a while, but then they may not have updated their knowledge or, you know, they, you know, they've been doing it for a while. So, you know, they're kind of used to what they're doing. I think right. kind of educating and working with them uh, is really important. And like you said, playing nice in the sandbox is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So we do have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so we'll start with the first one here. Uh, first one says, uh, I've gotten a lot of great mentorship on currently keeping an open mind during residency to find uh, best find what I love and what I'm good at. When do you think is an optimal time to really narrow in on that niche? Is it during residency, fellowship, or early faculty career? Great question. I think all three, honestly, because it might change. You know, I, I can honestly swear you know hand to god i had during uh residency and even during fellowship i was sure i was going to become a fellowship director positive of it and and then once i got into practice i realized that i kind of hate admin work like i don't like all the paperwork that goes along with it and so i realized that as much as i love the teaching component of of being a fellowship director i don't like all the paperwork and the red tape that comes along with it and so i said well maybe that's not actually the best fit for me and so my plan my niche changed a lot um and i realized that you know i can educate uh my fellow still and my residents still without being the fellowship director and then I, it gives me enough freedom to be able to educate the masses which i actually really love to do because i don't just educate one patient at a time i educate you know hundreds or thousands of patients at a time anybody or potential patients at a time anybody who tunes into any of the you know the the networks i'm on or my instagram or whatever can get education from me and so I think that to start thinking about it during residency is a great idea, but but don't like pigeonhole yourself. If 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 your interest changes, like I said, go where you love, because otherwise, like all the work that you put into that, just because you know the young version of yourself decided you wanted to do one thing, and then as you got older, you're like, well, that actually sounds terrible for me. It, it's okay. Don't you don't have to do it. Nobody's holding you to the ground and saying you must do this. Otherwise, you you retract your entire medical career. You know. Um, so, so yeah, just every step, do a little check-in with yourself and say, am I happy with this? Do I like this? Uh, and if the answer is no, change it. If the answer is yes, for John. No, I, I, that's a great point. I, I think, uh, you touched on a, a really important, uh, fact is that time, uh, timing matters, um, and yeah. things can change over time too. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, when we're all younger, you know, my room, usual advice to you know young fellows is that try everything if you want to say yes then, then say yes try everything yeah. at least you know what you like and what you don't like and yeah. as you get older uh, priorities change timing changes too and you can pick and choose this yeah. reminds me of uh of the madam uh, uh athlete podcast that uh giselle arnie put on uh, she had margo patukian talking about how to say yes yeah. um and, and i think one thing that margo was really spot on in saying was say yes to the things that you like to do because then you'll do a good job at it. Um, and right. so, yeah, she kind of had to sample around as with all of us, you know, we kind of had to sample around and say, well, I like this, but I don't like that. Um, and then, you know, you get to your point where, you know, you're saying no to the things that you don't really want to do. Maybe not right. right now, not necessarily yeah. because you absolutely hate it. Well, some, some of it is, but, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's the timing that matters too. Right. Like I, so, you know, I said, yes, my whole career my whole career. And, and only recently kind of since this year, have I started saying no a little bit more part of it's because we found out we're having a baby. And so I'm like, I should probably slow down a little bit, not forever, just for now. Um, so, you know, there's some conferences that I'm not lecturing at this year because I'm like, I'm getting big and it's hard to travel sometimes. And I don't want to do that right now. Um, and I want to spend time with my, you know, my family. Um, and part of it is just, yeah, it's not bringing me joy anymore. And if it's not bringing you joy, then say no, or at least say no for now. And um, I love Margot. I think she's so smart. So anything she says, do it because she's, <laughs> she, she really has a great outlook about, you know, how to, how to make, um, uh, you know, find, find kind of some, make medicine fun for yourself. Yeah. And thanks to Andy. Mark. He posted the, uh, the link to that uh, podcast. So it's available. Awesome. In the thanks, Andy. Next question uh, in the chat, uh, it's saying, while trying to find your niches in and outside of medicine, did you get pushback from your employer? And how do you navigate it if the employer isn't 100% supportive? 
uh, yeah, you leave. No, I'm kidding. Um, you could leave. Uh, so I did get pushback at my at my first hospital system that I worked with, and like I said, it wasn't from it wasn't from my department. It was from higher up in the in the in the system, and um, that's a little bit tougher to deal with because um, you have very little control. Um, part of it is trying to understand why they're saying no. So if if they're giving you pushback, ask for why. Um, I know it sounds like you're like, well, I don't want to rock the boat. It's okay. It's you have, you have something that you want to offer. Um, sometimes the no is just a not right now on their part too. Um, and sometimes it's cause they don't actually understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, and so it is okay to ask why, and it is okay to come to them and say, okay, well, I understand why you're saying it's a no, or you're not letting me do this. Um, what if we tried to go about it in this other direction? I think people are, and, and uh, hospital systems are more willing to cooperate with you when you have a new idea, if you actually give them a solution to the problem and not just point out the problem. So when I first started out of fellowship, I came in like guns blazing and I was like, this is shitty, this is bad. Sorry, I shouldn't swear. This is bad, this is bad, this doesn't work. We should change this, da 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 da, da. But I had no answers, right? I just said it needs to change but I don't know how or why or whatever. And so what do I get? Well, a lot of like, oh, yeah, we know, but here we are. So until you can figure out ways to help them fix the problem or fix the issue that's not really working, you're gonna have a hard time getting a lot of yeses. Now in private practice, sometimes it's a little bit easier to get yeses, sometimes not so much. Sometimes it's like, yeah, sure, but it's on your time on your dime. Um, that's a great motto. I'm going to start using that now. Your time, your dime. But in, in other cases, it's it's a little bit more willing. Um, the issue in academics, because that's what I can speak from, because that's where I work. The issue with academics is there's a lot of red tape. So there's a lot of layers of permissions that we have to go through. And sometimes it's just easier to say no, because they don't got to do all the paperwork. And so if you can say, look, I, I can figure out the paperwork. I got it done. Here's my business proposal. Here's why it's going to work. Here's all the good things about it. You're more likely to get a yes. Yeah, no, that that that's absolutely uh, what I what I a hundred percent of what I would agree with too. Um, you know, I it reminds me of a quote from uh, from Bar Rescue, uh, John Taffrey. He says, "I don't embrace I don't embrace problems. I don't embrace complaints. I embrace solutions." And so you yeah. have to provide solutions to those. Um, but on the other side, you know, it brings up a good point in that if somebody thinks that they're passionate about you know a certain establishing a certain niche and they get at the very first side of pushback, they start, decide to drop out. Maybe that's not something that they love. Um, right. That's, that's what I've- Or not right now. Yeah. They're like, I don't have the energy to do this right now. So, okay, I'll revisit this in a year. And that's okay. All right. I think we, have, we got uh, enough uh, time for one or two more questions. Uh, and I want to ask you uh, something very specific as well. Um, and so you, we talked about, uh, or you discussed how, you know, how do you differentiate yourself from the general uh, physician. But you know, let's say you've established a niche or you've identified a niche and a void uh, for yourself, for example, dance medicine. How do you differentiate yourself from somebody who's in the same niche? So how do you differentiate yourself from the expert? Yeah, um, I think connection is the big way to do that. So there's a lot of experts at a lot of different things. Um, and again, so, so how do you become the expert of the expert? And you, you don't necessarily have to be the smartest expert or the best expert, but you need to be the expert who makes it make sense for the patient. Um, and so in, in dance medicine, for example, my, my biggest thing, my biggest um, connection, I guess, or the thing that makes me maybe a better expert than a lot of other dance doctors is that I, I, I totally understand what these dancers go through. I had three knee surgeries in college during my dance career. Um, I, I get what it's like to literally define yourself as a dancer. I mean, my first tattoo was of a dancer. Like it's, 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 it is me, it is ingrained in me. And so I'm not saying all of you need to go get tattoos of whatever <laughs> niche you want to work in. But what I'm saying is like, when you eat and sleep and breathe it, it's a lot easier to see the passion. And so it's a lot easier for, for those patients or that patient population to trust you. Um, and, and making the patient feel like we're in, again, we're in this together. That's like my biggest thing. I, you know, I, I definitely am, I am not the softest doctor that you're ever going to meet. I, I don't do a ton of hand holding, but I do a lot of tough love. And I say, I am in this 100% with you. 
And so we will figure out what's going to work for you because there, there is no benefit to you. If I tell you what to do and you don't do any of it, then neither of us win. So it's about be honest with me, tell me what you're willing to do. And I'm going to figure out a way to make that work for us. And there's very few times that I'll tell a patient, absolutely not. You can't do that. Like if they want to just run on a stress fracture, then I'm like, no, we're not going to do that today. But otherwise, I really try to work around their schedule. I try to work around their um, quality of life or their, their life goals and what they're hoping to achieve. And I think that in the dance population, that goes so far because telling a dancer to just stop dancing is not an option. Like it's just not. And so the second a doctor does that, they lose all faith in them. Um, so for me, being able to kind of turn the tables and make them feel like I'm on their team as opposed to it's me versus them. I, I, that's what seems to, to really make, you know, make me stand out for that population. Yeah, you, you touched on a really good point. Uh, you know, sometimes what makes you stand out as opposed to another, let's say, expert is that you have personal experience. Um, you know, you're a dancer yourself and then now you're a dance doc. You know, we see this in orthopedic surgery all the time. You know, a lot of orthopedic surgeons, they used to play football, they used to play baseball, and then they, they make incredible football docs. They make incredible baseball docs too. You know, I'm a musician myself. And then, you know, I remember, you know, taking care of some musicians. I'm like, oh yeah, I know how to play that instrument. I understand what you're doing. Yeah. And then you make that connection. Um, and so that, that, that's really, really important. In the military population, you know, if, some, if the military doc has gone through what training uh, that, that they've gone through, they understand what that's all about too. Yeah. So I think that's really, really important uh, and something uh, that, you know, it, it may not be, you know, something that everybody has to go through, but it certainly can make you stand out and, uh, and give you an extra edge in creating that niche. Right. Even just learning some of the lingo. So like, if you have an interest, like if you had an interest in esports, like learning what that lingo is, like, I, I don't, I don't know that lingo, but like for dance, like if, if somebody says it hurts when I do a rond de jean and you're like, what? you know, it, it's the same thing as a football player being like, well, you know, uh, my position's quarterback. And you're like, what's a quarterback? Uh, it's the same thing. Like they just totally lose faith in you if you can't learn the lingo. So at least learn the lingo, even if you don't, you never existed in that world previously, learn the lingo of that world or of that population. And they're going to feel a lot better in your hands. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think this applies to not only just sports medicine too. Um, and so I, I think, you know, you bring, you bring up a really good point in terms of knowing the lingo, having the personal experiences. You know, my wife is a geriatrician and she makes, she's an excellent geriatrician because she went through it with her grandmother. Um, and so, you know, you and, know. and I tell her, I can never do what you do because I can never understand because I, ne right. I never had that personal experience. Um, right. But, you know, on the flip side, she says, I can never be a sports doc because she's going to ask questions all the time about, well, what's a quarterback? Well, where does this ball go? Where, where does right. this go? And yeah. so, you know, I, I think that that's a really good point. All right, that's about all the time that we have and all the questions that we have. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ira Freddy, for joining us. Um, and. Uh, appreciate you for uh, for sharing your experience and your expertise, um, and we hope you enjoyed this uh, this webinar. Um, like I said, in July we will be at the fellowship uh, fellows uh, research and leadership conference uh, at the jobs panel. Um, they will there will be panelists there to answer any questions, and then in August or September uh, we will be talking about subspecialization in sports medicine. How and what are the business and financial implications of that? Um, that talk will be given by Dusty Narducci and John, John uh, Dresner and uh, moderated by uh, Kathy Webb. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And thank you to Dr. Ira Freddy and Andy Meyer again. Um, thank you and good night. Thanks, Dr. Who. Thanks, Andy.